It's built with a beautiful bunch of images and tables. This is the way real people laid things out back then. But we're going to upgrade that protocol with H2. Um, it's going to, uh, to, to do a full upgrade, you need to have the browser, the server, and any important devices in between being able to speak that protocol. If any of them don't, you'll just be left with H1. That's not so bad. I mean, you know how to deal with that, and you've been dealing with it for 20 years. But H2 is really going to change things. It really started when Google started looking at some of the problems with H1, and they said, we think there's a better way to do this. We, we can find a, a way to speed this process up. So, of course, being that they wanted to come up with a good marketing name, they used Speedy. And I, I think that's an acronym for something, but it doesn't really matter. Um, they introduced that in Chrome in 2011. And it didn't take very long for other browsers to see that it was faster and include it as well. But there's, um, you know, the major driver was that Chrome had it and that Google servers supported it. And you can see today um, that it's actually all that green. It's pretty widely supported. Really, the only major red spots that you might encounter are Opera Mini and the UC browser for Android, which is primarily used in China. So otherwise, pretty much all the browsers that we're using on our phones and desktops all support H2 already, I mean, it's Speedy already. The, the change with H2 was that all of the people realized that Speedy was kind of ad hoc. It was, it was a Google experiment. And they really, everyone, including Google, wanted to go through a process to standardize this. Um, and considering how long we've been working with H1, it didn't take very long. Um, by this year, uh, by last year, they had completely standardized the protocol. And here's when you know things are getting pretty serious. Speedy is actually gone in Chrome 51, which is the currently shipping version of Chrome. So they said, I think there's a, there's a way to turn it back on with a setting, but by default, Speedy is not there anymore. And that was, that was Google saying, OK, guys, we're really serious. You know, we're not going to be supporting Speedy the rest of our lives. Um, so when you, if, if you've noticed things slowing down for some websites, it could be because Speedy support has been withdrawn. But we've got H2. And it's supported pretty much as well as Speedy was supported. There's some funny colors here in the graph. You'll see uh, IE11. The reason that's kind of a funny green is because in, on Windows 7, it's basically IE support depends on the network stack in the, in the version of Windows you're on. Um, and again, we see some laggards in China um, that if, you're, if you have a heavily Chinese-oriented audience, it's possible that they'll be on H1 for a long time because probably the Great Firewall of China doesn't support H2. Um, you can also see that it's not just the server side. I mentioned that it needs to be the path all the way through. You can see that all of the network plumbing out there, there's a lot of green on this list. So you can see that important uh, devices, including servers like Nginx, now support H2. Uh, Node.js has an H2 uh, module. So we're looking really good there. Uh, it's, there's a few, a little more red here. Uh, by the way, focus on the last column. There's, there's some other parts of this having to do with TLS and security that is also important uh, for performance. But looking just at H2, you can see that the main one that I would, uh, that I see as being an impediment to people switching, is uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, it they just haven't finished um, their support of H2. But almost everybody else, except for, you can see the Chinese, China Net Center, uh, don't support it. And the Edgecast, which turns out to be a pretty important uh, player as well, they're just a little slow on quite a few of the uh, important security issues. Um, H2 is being used by some really big sites. So, you know, there's, there's people who are kind of force multipliers in, in our uh, world. And, you know, when WordPress supports H2, then all the blogs that WordPress uh, hosts are supporting H2. Same with Blogger and Medium. Um, 
there's some ones like Tumblr that still don't support H2, mainly because they're on EdgeCast, uh, and you're going to see them running H1 rather than, uh, they were supporting Speedy, but they're going to really fall back. So I expect that that will be a prod for them to speed up their implementation of Speedy, uh, of uh, H2. So why do we need a new protocol? Well, the main reason is because H1 is pretty dumb. And it's something, uh, it's a lot like internal combustion engines. Um, we're so used to burning gasoline that we don't realize how inefficient and messy and you know just all the horrible things that internal combustion engines do. It's kind of like H1. We're so used to having to do multiple connections and combining files and creating sprite sheets and trying to tweak our HTML so that things get loaded in the right order. Um, we just, you know, we just think that's the way you develop uh, web applications because we've been doing it for so long. Um, and b the reason we're trying to do all those things is because we need to fight latency. Latency is a real, the round trip time between you and the server is a killer. And we just can't improve the speed of light. That means that, you know, especially when you're trying to go from here to the United States or to Australia, those times are horrible. And latency is something that we can't overcome. We can only try to uh, figure out ways to make latency less of a problem. Um, we've, one of the other ways that H2 tries to uh, fix our issues is it's a binary protocol. Um, I love asking this question because I always get a few hands raised. How many people use Telnet to debug their sessions? All right, there's the guy right there. Um, I always say, when's the last time you did that? And there's also a guy, I do it all the time. Well, not anymore. You're not going to do it. Because uh, be, as a binary protocol, you really kind of have to fall back to tools to do your debugging other than just Telnet. You can't just type text into a window. But there's already plenty of tools for this. Uh, you know, the fancier protocol analyzers like Wireshark do it, browser tools inside Chrome and all the others will tell you whether you're negotiating a H2 connection. H2 requires a secure connection. So you need, um, although there's nothing in the protocol itself that says you couldn't do it unencrypted, it turns out that everybody got together and said, you know, it really doesn't make sense to do these unencrypted connections. They're trying to push the world towards encrypted connections. and. Probably the NSA has something to do with that. I, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons why you want an encrypted connection. There's a little bit of handshake overhead. I'll be showing you some um, uh, some benchmarks. It turns out that actually the improvements in the H2 protocol make things faster to the point where it overcomes this slightly increased amount of TLS handshake overhead. So let's look just a, a quick schematic of what H1 does and why it can be um, it can be slow. Um, for for a single connection to a server, there's this delay. I can send information. Once I start, once the server starts sending a file to me, though, there's no way to stop it. It just if it's a big image, for example, I'm showing here. If you look left to right, our server is sending things. The first thing it sent was this big image, which is 500K. Um, there was no way, like even though they're smaller files and you might want to try to get them to you before the big file, it was too late. Once you start that uh, connection and send that data, there's no way to stop in the middle uh, with H1. With H2, it's actually possible to stop in the middle. So even though the browser on this phone started asking for bigimage.jpg, um, it later decided that it really would rather have these CSS and JS files because it knows it really doesn't want to do its initial render until it gets the CSS and JS. Those are render blocking resources in most cases. So fortunately, with an H2 connection, the server can say, OK, wait a minute. If you need these things more, I'll just stop sending the JPEG file. And I will send you these more important resources. Um, instead, we'll come back to sending you the rest of this big image in a minute. 
So that's an extremely valuable thing to be able to do. Um, with H1, one of the other problems that you run into is, even though you can do multiple connections, every time on every connection, you send this huge user agent. And if you know the history of the user agent, you know that it is really a huge pack of lies. And it's, it's a large pack of lies, unfortunately. So this is the user agent for the latest version of Microsoft Edge. And it says it's Mozilla. But it could be Apple WebKit. But it could be like Gecko and it's Chrome or Safari. But it's really Edge. The, the, the uh, other aren't, the others aren't much better. I, I believe the Chrome, the latest Chrome is, for Chrome 51, is about 120 bytes. So we're talking about a large number of bytes that get sent across the line in every request. It's just a waste of upstream, uh, upstream bandwidth. Well, we have a solution for this in H2. It's called HPAC compression. Um, there was actually a more efficient way of doing this that was in um, Speedy. But it also had the ability to create more denial of service and uh, security exploits. So they went with a very, very simple Huffman encoding uh, process for HPAC. And uh, you can see over here with request headers, these are the request headers you would expect to see on each request that was going across a connection. What we can do is, first of all, in, in an H2 connection, there's a set called the static table. And these things it knows already in advance. Everybody is, like, in the static table is things like method is get. When you think about how many characters that is that it wastes, it's M-E-T-H-O-D colon space G-E-T carriage return line feed. That's a lot of characters. Well, instead now, method get is two. It's just two, the number two. So it saves a lot of bytes. Um, for ones that change, it sends a dynam dynamic table. So that huge, long 127 byte user agent, it's sent once, and then it becomes the number 62. And from then on, it just, for every other subsequent request, it can just send a 62, knowing that's that 127 byte request. So you can see that HPAC allows us to really shrink down the amount of data we're sending in the connection. Let's take a look, as a software developer, at the kinds of things that we do to try to make uh, connections work better. And some of these things still apply. Some of them need to be changed. Uh, we, you know, these are things that are in Steve Souter's um, seminal uh, things, rules for good uh, software development. Minimize DNS lookups, reuse HTTP connections, use a CDN, eliminate unnecessary request bytes, compress assets, cache resources. There's a few more there as well, but I, I focused on some of these because they need to be tweaked. Uh, I always pick on Huffington Post uh, as an example of a site that is... Uh, a nightmare. Um, this is actually pretty typical, though. Uh, it's also very typical of WordPress websites. Uh, anything that has a lot of framework to it, and I would say even uh, frameworks like Angular quite often end up growing to being very big and having large amounts. Uh, if you're using something like Bootstrap, most people don't try to reduce the amount of Bootstrap. They just dump it all in there. So you end up with something like this. But that's not all. There's this. But it's even worse than that. There's this. 240 requests, 3.8 megabytes for one page. And again, this is not unusual. If you look at, uh, I think the average web page size is creeping up on two megabytes now. So what can, what can we do that was done in that huge 240 requests? Let's be realistic first. We know that we are not going to get the average app or web page that you build down to 10 requests. It just ain't going to happen. So how can we ch change it so that when we need to make 200 requests, we can make them more efficiently? Um, one thing we can do is rethink domain sharding. The idea of domain sharding is that we can request from the same server with multiple connections in order to improve our bandwidth to the server. And we do that because of that round-trip time problem we have in H1. 
You can see that with Huffington Post because they use actually different domains. Now this violates that rule of minimizing DNS lookups. Um, so ideally, if you're using H2, you would get rid of this entirely and just request from one domain. Uh, because not only do you have to do another DNS lookup, each connection requires a warm-up period where the server and the client negotiate saying, I'm going to send you some data. If I start sending it too fast and losing packets, I'll slow down. But in, that, in the meantime, it takes that warm-up to figure out how much data can be sent over the connection. The other problem is I'm now, I now have 10 or 15 or 20 connections open at once. All of those are competing for resources. And that can cause congestion and retries. And even on H1, domain sharding is not a gimme as a performance improver. In most cases, the research that's been done say that two is the most you should ever use. Well, it shows, here's an example that shows that two is still too many. Um, this is a, uh, a look at webpagetest.org showing our s.huffpost.com and i.huffpost.com. And if you look here, when I was busy, S was not busy. So we weren't really even using the connections in a way where we needed two different domains. But we paid this cost of looking up the domain and warming up the connection twice. So we didn't really want to do that. When you look at web page test at the bottom, you'll see that this green line, ideally, you want to be using your connection maximally. You want to try to use all the bandwidth that the connection is giving you. And you can see, yes, it actually took, I think, 12 seconds to load. But between three and six seconds, we were hardly, hardly using the connections at all. So, so we spent three seconds just like doing nothing. And you can see we weren't using the CPU heavily either. So we were really wasting our bandwidth. We, we had a, probably a lot of delays in there, uh, round trip time delays. Now it turns out that H2 has a solution that is friendly to both H1 and H2. If you have a certificate, assuming you're going to use a secure connection, and you should, if you have a, a certificate that's valid for two different domains, and the names resolve to the same IP address, H2 will use the same connection for both hosts. Now, it requires some work on your server side to make sure that it understands it's multiplexing those connections. But that's why you got the TLS wildcard certificate for both. When you do that, you can use sharding in the, in the case where it actually was beneficial. It wasn't here. But you can use sharding for the case in H1 where you need it. But you won't pay the overhead in H2. So you really kind of get the best of both worlds. One of the other tricks that people use uh, to reduce their, um, uh, their upstream bandwidth is something or downstream bandwidth as well is something called cookie-less domains. And so in this case, um, if I set a cookie for the main HuffPost.com site so that I can send information back and forth, probably I don't need those cookies for images. And so the reason I may have set those domains differently in the first place was so I didn't need to send cookies back and forth between those and use up more bandwidth. Well, with HPAC, it really doesn't matter. We, we don't have to worry about those things. So you can get rid of the cookie-less domains and just use a single domain. Um, the other trick that you'll see in this HuffPost is that they were using um, a server-side script combining uh, program, uh, it, it happens to be in PHP, that was taking a bunch of different CSS or JS files and combining them into one big lump. And that was a part of a best practice, especially for H1, that said, OK, well, you want to reduce the number of requests, so I'm going to send you this giant URL. And on the back end, it's going to cache all these things, obviously. Um, but I'm only going to send you one big file that's the combination of all of these JavaScript or CSS files. However, even though it reduces requests, um, think about what happens when any of these files change. Um, in my case, you know, maybe um, config.json, uh, you know, a config.js changes because I've changed my configuration. I've invalidated this entire lump of code. 
Now it's going to have to put a new cash buster in here, which is probably a numeric, you know, like the date stamp. Uh, now it has to put a new cash busting thing in there and re-request the entire thing, even if it was in cash, just because one byte, you know, I changed a number from 10 to 11 in a config file. So combining files was a best practice in H1, but not necessarily in H2. It's a good idea when possible to kind of spread your files out a little more and don't make your files so big that they'll take a long time to download. Um, uh, the trick you can use for that is what I call a core than more strategy. Uh, a lot of you are probably using something like this already. You know, your, your render critical, first render critical resources, your JavaScript, your CSS, your initial HTML, go there at the head of the file, top into the HTML file. And then everything else can be loaded asynchronously. Um, tools like Webpack make this pretty easy to do with bundles. Um, you know, a lot of people use all kinds of different tools for doing this, but the, but the idea is basically the same. Just, just your render critical um, resources in the file or at the very top in the head. Everything else can come in asynchronously as needed. With H2, one of the best practices you've used with H1 may be to inline resources. Uh, with H2, you don't really need to do that. It's actually better to keep them separate. Just put them up in the head, and H2 will pull those in because that initial scan that the uh, browser does to find resources, it'll find those pretty quickly and request them very early in the process. If you use inlining, the problem there is you can get useless renders because it will see uh, the resources there. You can render a page that really isn't even a functional page. So that's kind of a waste of the browser's time to do that. And it can cause kind of strange artifacts on the screen. OK, now here I'm delivering on benchmarks. Um, this is an interesting benchmark that Nginx ran uh, on their implementation. Um, so the blue is HTTP. Green is HTTP2, and uh, this, whatever color that would be, kind of a brown is HTTPS, the old H H1 over uh, TLS. And you can see that in this red area that I've circled, that's the only place where unencrypted H1 beats H2, but it's still faster than encrypted H1. So if you're running like a site that's already encrypted, for example, a com e commerce site, then you're still going to get, get better performance under H2 even with encryption. So you can see that as long as latencies are less than 300 milliseconds, you're getting, you're getting double wins here. You're getting better uh, than even unencrypted H1, which is, you know, how can you argue with that? Um, now, here's where we get to some really mind-blowing stuff. Um, server push. I'll say in advance that a lot of this has not been worked out, that you're not going to see all these benefits today with H2. Because the people, you know, the, especially because it's server-based, there's a lot of techniques that people are still experimenting with. But I, I've talked to some people who are working on this, and there's some really interesting and exciting things going on. So. Uh, being ready means potentially just enabling H2 in your own apps. And your CDN provider or other server-side resources may just make it faster. You'll wake up one day and people will say, gee, it's a lot faster. Um, here's an example, though. I, um, the browser, you, you know, you go and you click on a link that says products.html. The browser says semi-products.html. The server... Uh, has seen lots of people request products that HTML. It knows about those things. Uh, maybe it's keeping a statistical log. Maybe it's been pre-told in advance by you or some tool you have that if you need products that HTML, you're going to need above the fold.css. It's not very big, but I know you're going to need it. So I'm just going to send it to you. Even if it's cached, you know, half the requests for this page don't have it cached. So I might as well just send it to you. I, I'd rather send it to you now than wait. This can be done by predictive algorithms. So like, whoa, this, this is the kind of stuff that 
uh, this is an example of one simple app that somebody put together saying, look at all these round trip times, these large green bars. When you get server push, these disappear into almost nothing. They just come down almost immediately. There's no, basically there's no uh, delay at all. So, you know, this is a somewhat contrived example, but you can see load time for this simple app was reduced by 60%. Whoa. This is the kind of stuff that we want to see, you know, where we get something kind of for free and then we can just take credit for it as, as developers. There's some other interesting work. This is just one example that's going on. Uh, something called a bloom filter. Um, if the client can collaborate with the server um, and say, look, server, I've got a bunch of stuff in my cache uh, for this website, for this uh, domain. And I'm just going to tell you in advance, like, the last hundred files that I had requested from this domain. And I'm going to do it in a compact form. Um, something like a, um, a service worker, when we start implementing things in service workers on, on the uh, client side, would be great for implementing this. Um, server push can be made even more efficient because basically you say, here's what I already have. Here's a list of requests. I'm going to give you a list of priority requests as I, as I determine them. Here's what I already have. The server can look at that and say, well, I can see you're saying you don't have this in your cache. I'm just going to start sending it now. So, like, whoa. That's even more, more amazing. I don't know what this cat was looking at. I guess I had, I just love cats. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of a feeling for what it's like to be a browser and, and, and uh, deal with H2. Um, streams in an H2 uh, connection have a weight, and they, uh, which is basically a priority number, uh, and they have a dependency. So as, you, uh, as the browser sends requests to the um, server over the connection, it says, here's how badly I think I need the file. And here are the other things that I need um, either before or after. Basically, it's sending a, a dependency tree as it's requesting these resources. So it can say, I need logo.jpg. But while, by the way, there's no use sending logo.jpg unless I, you've already sent me index.html because I'm going to need, that's, you know, that's the place where it's embedded. Um, and the server can deliver bytes based on the priority and the dependency. So it's going to essentially, on the server side, be maintaining this uh, more complex data structure about what you need as a, uh, as a client. This is a cool little napkin diagram that the Firefox uh, developer drew uh, about the way he, uh, they initially implemented it in Firefox. Uh, he had the, something called leaders, which were the things that he knew that were needed quickly, so that would be like JS and CSS that were render blocking. And then followers would be things like images that can be put in later. And then things that are unblocked by any other activity on the page, like a asynchronous XHR request, uh, can happen whenever there's time. Um, and then background stuff like the beacons that might be on the page. So for best H2 performance, here's some things that are a little different. Um, you want to minimize the number of concurrent connections. Um, so we don't, con you know, in, in H2, you don't try uh, shotgunning uh, 100, con you know, or five, six, seven connections to the same server. That's a waste. You have one connection. You have a really nice basket, and you put all your eggs in it. Um, so by minimizing those connections, now we can warm that one connection up quickly. We know how much bandwidth it can take. And... Um, so the downside of that as an H1 user is you want to delay the use of other domains. Don't try to make simultaneous requests to your server, some other uh, third-party CDN server, an ad server. You know, if there are five or six connections trying to connect simultaneously, then they'll still be competing and that will make your connection, probably what I would consider your main connection to your own server, that will make it less efficient. Because now, 
when it tries to warm up that connection, there are four or five other connections that it competes with. This really changes the way that you think about how, how to use CDNs. You probably don't want to use a public CDN like Google or the Microsoft uh, Ajax uh, CDN unless you're getting a significant number of files from it. So if you are using jQuery, jQuery UI, jQuery themes, um, you know, some other things all from there and, and they make up, uh, you know, a 500K worth of your requests, it might be worthwhile. But never, never decide that, well, I want to try to optimize by spreading my requests out across multiple CDNs. That's a real waste because then you're making a connection to Google CDN, Microsoft CDN, you know, that's definitely not the way to do it. Only use a public CDN if you're getting a lot of files and bytes. Okay, so you're a developer and you're like, okay, I think I did everything to make it fast for H2, but how do I know it's using it? Well, it turns out that there's some really good things that the browser makers have done. Um, when you get in Chrome, you press F12, you look at your network connection uh, tab, and last I looked, protocol was not one of the default things, but you can right click on the header here and just select uh, protocol as one of the things that you can turn on. And you can see here it shows H2, photos.google.com. You'll also see here it's negotiating first an H1 connection and says, you know, if I can do H2 if you can, and says, yep, I can do it, we're good. Um, Firefox, also uh, in the detail view, you can see the version here, H2. Edge, uh, same thing here. The kind of odd quirk with uh, some, sometimes with things coming out of cache, it doesn't know the protocol that was used to get it into cache, it just knows it's coming out of cache. So things that are 304, you'll sometimes see HTTPS, even though it was requested originally with H2 from the server. So don't be alarmed. There's something called the HTTP2 and speedy indicator that's available as a plugin. This only tells you if the HTML file that you're getting was H2. Quite often, as you saw here, you will see a mix of here, for example, here, this, this photo came out as quick plus speedy, even though the page was requested with H2. So, You'll probably for a while, especially from your ad networks, ad networks seem to be slow at this, you'll be seeing H1 and potentially speedy on some browsers for a while before everybody switched over to H2. So the good news is H1 and H2 can coexist. As a software developer, you can, um, you, it's not like you have to abandon optimizing for H1. You, but you can think about H2 as what you really should be aiming for now. If your back end, if your servers and your CDNs and the other things that I showed on that list are capable of H2, you should be seriously looking at that. I'll always also do some testing, like, you know, test and see, did it really get better? I hope it did. I'd really like to know if it didn't and know why. I've got some great resources of people who did try some things, and you can kind of see what pros and cons they had during that conversion process. Um, but primarily, ensure that your servers or CDNs are supporting H2. If you are using, uh, if your company is using its own CDN uh, through a provider, make sure that it's enabled for H2. Uh, and you can make it effective without breaking H1. Just Think about things like eliminating sharding and use, say, a wildcard certificate so that you can shard for H1 and you don't have to shard for H2. Um, don't create a single large JS or and or CSS file. Try to do that core and more strategy. Um, test. Once, you, once you've experimented, make sure that you're getting the goodness that was promised. Um, you know, when you start split, splitting up your files a little more, make sure that it's really working. Um, and also keep an eye open. Like I, I mentioned, some of the things that are in server push, those things are, are bleeding edge, but I think they're really going to be exciting as we start uh, seeing them come out. So um, please, you know, I, I think we're going to find 
that as we, as we uh, experiment with these things, that H2 is going to give us a lot of benefits that, that we can go, yeah, yeah, I, my code is really that good, and really all we had to do is throw a switch. So um, that's my talk. Uh, again, the green cards down there are very important for you to use. Um, I have, we've got time for questions, or you know, maybe we can go to a bar or something. I, I don't know. We're, uh, this is, like say, the final talk of the day, so I'm uh, looking forward to your questions, though. I'll be glad to answer any questions you've got. Let me show you here. This is the resources page that's at the end of the talk. These are some great presentations, uh, references to uh, H2 being used for all types of things. So, and this is the link to the presentation that I just showed you. So, um, thank you very much. <laughs> Who has some questions? Yes. Uh, the question was, uh, I mentioned HTTP2 um, requires more resources on the server side for some of these things like the H2 header compression and essentially just for tracking things like that dependency and priority table. Um, that, that is a concern. It's one of the reasons why they used a simpler compression uh, algorithm. I would point out, though, that because all of the browsers are using a single H2 connection, whereas before they were using somewhere between 6 and 10 uh, H1 connections, the benefit we have there is that we are reducing the number of connections that are being made to the server. So as for whether that balances out, I don't know. Uh, the server people don't seem to have raised any alarm, and I know they were part of the process in determining and defining H2. So I think... Um, Ideally, it's uh, no worse than a wash as far as uh, the fact that we're doing fewer connections. It's just a single connection that is uh, more complex. Yeah, but the abusers are going to do multiple connections with HTTP2, right? Uh, the, the abusers might do multiple connections. I don't know if, uh, you know, if you talk to some of the bigger um, CDN providers, they may uh, have uh, you know mitigations that they're um, that they're applying against that. For example, I don't know if it makes any sense for a single uh, client to be to have multiple connections. So they may, if they can determine it's the same client, they may simply reject connections from the same clients. Um, you know, obviously, if it's behind some uh, device that's connecting through the same IP address, you can't use IP address as, as a mechanism. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, that, that is something that, like I say, I would think that the people who are involved in the process would have raised an alarm if they thought it was significantly more re, uh, resource intensive for the server. Other questions? Yeah. Right. So, so the question is, how, how much uh, expense is there? How, uh, how, com how much complexity in requesting, uh, like, the core and more strategy? I think that's a place where um, there needs to be uh, more research. And I think no matter what you want, uh, no matter what you would want to make sure that you tested for your application, I think that it's most likely that 900, that is, no bundling at all is probably the wrong solution because 900 is just a big number. I know that um, someone was saying that they were using uh, Browserify. They were using a, they were basically walking the dependency tree on the fly on the client side and just walking the dependency tree saying, well, you know, we don't want to actually bundle anything. We'll just request the individual files. The amount of, of uh, CPU time it took to walk the dependency tree was massive. So that would kind of advise against requesting all 900 files individually. But 
I, I don't know where the sweet spot is. Would it be like in the case of H1, it's probably more like 10 or 15 bundles. Maybe in the case of H2, it's more like 100 bundles. Um, and obviously, it depends. If you absolutely know that if this resource changes, that these other 20 change, you might as well put them in a bundle. But I, I don't think there's been enough done there to, to come up with a definitive answer. And maybe, maybe there can't be one. I don't know. Other questions? Yeah. So, so the question was, I, I've heard a lot of negative things about 2.0. Can you say whether they're wrong or right? I, I've looked at some of those, and, and actually some of them I, are referenced in that uh, resources page. Some of them, uh, one of them was about this issue of trying to resolve hundreds of files, and it turned out that that was more about the amount of time it took to resolve, not the connection, H2, H2 connection. Um, there was one that the, um, I'm trying to remember. There was another one that one group did. Um, and I think they were saying there was an issue with Firefox, but not Chrome. I think you're going to see some of these things as people start. And, and tr like, if you think about what happened when we used H1 to begin with, we created this big toolkit of things. Like I say, it's very similar to the internal combustion engine. You go, oh, you know, lead gas kills people. We'll figure out a way around that. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we're still on with H2. But as far as specific things, um, I think it's usually just a don't go crazy thing. So uh, a lot of times when people were using Browserify, for example, they would create a single large app.js, and that's not good. I would also say that uh, 900 files is not good. So the, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. And right now, probably the best way to find that out is to experiment on your app to know, you know whether the, num the right number is 5 or 500. Um, but if you know some specific things, I mean, if, there, if you know a specific knock against H2, um, I think the main thing that I've heard is people who say, my boss says that we need to get the ads onto the page as quickly as possible. So this is crazy. We can't only have one connection you know, on the page. Um, this goes to another talk that I have about performance. And people are always you know, thinking, well, I need to put the ads on the page as quickly as possible because that's how I make money. But you can see a, pa a page like Huffington Post when you try to load it on your phone that take 12 to 15 seconds, sometimes 20 seconds to load. People don't wait for that. So, so people think that it's important to you know, have everybody rush for the door and get that ad up on the page. But if they actually built a page that, that responded quickly, you would keep the user busy enough that they would start reading, and the ad could come in, and they would stay for it. So I, sometimes I think the concerns are misguided. Um, you know, that, Really, you want to try to follow the best practices and you know, look at the people who are doing it, the guys like Google or Facebook or Amazon. They're not crazy. You know, they're, they're trying to do, if they saw that it was cutting their revenue by half, they'd be taking it out real fast. So, um, so I think some of those may be overblown just because people haven't really had the chance to experiment with them. I know there's other questions. Yes, right here. Right. The, the H2 also has flow control and the prioritization in particular, the ability um, to, uh, to stop sending something that it determines later is not as important as something else, is an incredibly valuable re, uh, thing. And some of these benchmarks really don't reflect those benefits. Um, it's really easy to accidentally, when you create your HTML file, uh, the resources are in the file in kind of a random order, it, and the, the pre-scanner looks for what it can request from the server. That's not the optimal order. 
It's never the optimal order. Um, and that's where the reordering, the reprioritization that H2 provides can really improve performance for free to you there. Um, but again, definitely A-B test H1 versus H2 and make sure that you feel comfortable with it. Other questions? All right. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, the, the, uh, there's only one connection in H2 per server. Yeah, uh, so that connection, when does that shut down? I mean, when the browser has gotten all the files it currently needs, it will then shut down, is, is that a socket, is it shutting down, and then you have to reconnect uh, when you, next time you need the files, so it's open? So uh, the, the connection can stay open the same way it times out with an H1 connection, uh, so it doesn't have to shut down immediately. Um, Yeah, the, the, the server can be pushing things. Uh, because it doesn't have to be just files that you're requested, it can be pushing things um, you know, at, at a later time as well. Okay. Yes? Uh, we are also using uh, HTTP in, in terms of uh, uh, SOA, uh, in REST for the uh, implementation. Do you think that HTTP2 can also help to improve the performance of REST service? I'm sorry, can H2 do what? Can uh, improve performance in REST services. Oh, can H2 import, uh, improve performance in REST services? Um, I, would, I would think, well, it depends on uh, the amount of data you're sending and the frequency of that data. If it's, um, I mean, the fact that you don't have to do, um, uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't try to speculate there because I, I don't know for sure, but I would, I think the main benefits of H2 would be either in the initial page load where there's a lot of resources to pull in or in a high frequency transaction situation. So if, you're, if your REST service is transacting quite a bit with, uh, with your client, then yes, it might do there, but, but I, I don't know for sure. Other questions? Okay, well, feel free to come up and ask questions. Thank you very much.